relatively recently in uh, I think January a couple of us went down to Nevada and uh, helped to uh, do a lot of uh, organization and some other stuff down at uh, Eric's lab for EPD laboratories and finally got a telluric transmitter running tested it out it works Griffin's going to tell you uh, more about that and what, what some of his experiments um, have uh, come up with in terms of uh, real results, kind of the equipment that he's using to measure this and, and conduct these experiments. And I think Haka says has been working pretty closely with uh, Griffin on these projects. And this is uh, another one of uh, areas of research of great interest uh, uh, to Eric. So we're all kind of collaborating, you know, kind of behind the scenes. A lot of the updates haven't really come out on a lot of what we have uh, going on. But you have been, uh, I, I want to mention uh, Griffin's website, griffingbrock.com. Yeah. So griffingbrock.com, he has a lot of uh, you know, videos and posts, and you can kind of follow his work on there. Um, also, I believe there's a PayPal donate link. Yeah. And so uh, we do everything that we can to support Griffin, bring traffic in that, in that way. And so obviously these experiments cost money. And when Griffin is building stuff, he builds it, um, you know, uh, you know, b beautiful models. And he's he's very um, uh, careful and skillful with everything he's doing. It's this all, everything he's doing is also very replicatable. So um, pay close attention to what he's going to share. And um, there's going to be a lot more in terms of uh, presentations and information coming out with this category. And there's a couple others here that are also conducting some telluric experiments that we're working with. Uh, Riggs, um, I think Steve Young, uh, Stephen McGreevy, who presented on the natural earth radio with his um, low frequency receivers so you can hear the earth sounds and everything. They're also collaborating with us on an ongoing basis on all this. So this presentation will be about an hour and then uh, there'll be some demonstration. And so help welcome uh, Griffin Brock. Okay, well, as a matter of time to keep this fairly short, this is just a simple presentation on just my current research on Tesla telluric communication as applied just to single wire, single coil applications. So we'll get right into this, but I think bef right before we do, there should be some brief background just in the relative history of single wire or just earth-related communication. So of course, uh, in doing so, we should mention the early days of the very telegraph system. Now, in the 1870s, 1880s, that's when we started to see a major spike in telegraphic communications, especially using usually two conductor wires, which were efficient at the time. But then, of course, later on, we found that through the use of just a mess and see of this illustration, which shows just wires going around town everywhere, creating a massive cluster, we find that there was a man by the name of Carl August von Steinhill, and he was able to find a more sophisticated and very efficient yet simplistic way of reducing the telegraph to only one wire transmission. Now, of course, this was called the telegraph or earth return circuit, which employed only one wire, whereas the other wire, rather than being a second conductor or a rail, as proposed in the early days, was simply a rod or plate connected to the ground. And this, at the time, was thought to act electro, um, electrochemically, depending on the plates and metal used. But of course, there seems to be more of a dynamic inductive line, uh, lines of force which present between the plates, but then also with other natural phenomena which occur. And I want to take into consideration and view the audience to pay attention to this inductance coil. Now, of course, this setup involves three multiple coils which act in tandem in a balanced configuration, but for this case, we will just confine ourselves to the explanations of a single inductance coil. Now, at the time of Tesla's innovation, but then also at the turn of the century in which Hertzian waveforms were primarily used, we could see that there are similar designs such as the spark gap tuning coil, which acts to inductively tune the antenna element in a Hertzian method such as this, which could also be used in conjunction with a decent ground terminal, also as a longitudinal or telluric pickup. Now, of course, this, this setup possesses some issues, which is represented here in one of Tesla's diagrams as just a single coil, which is similar to that of the secondary, but nevertheless still works. A single coil could be used, although the balancing scheme 
and the very efficiency it seems to tend to wane, especially in the receiving sense as the selectivity and just the overall balancing configuration, which I've noticed from personal experience, does not seem to be that beneficial. Nevertheless, a simple coil such as this early spark gap tuning coil could be used in this configuration for reception, but I highly disregard it being used in a transmission setup, although it could be used with decent efficiency. Like I said, the balancing scheme and just the overall distribution of the lines of force and overall inductive induction fields along a single coil seems to not exactly be beneficial, but of course that's still open for greater research in time to come. And that is why the thicker the wire, the better, as you're able to establish a better connection with that of the earth. But of course, this was a decent learning tool and a very interesting engineering solution to get around. It did pose some very interesting telluric examples or effects which were obtained, such as the coil which was shown yesterday. This is a single coil which is situated upon a little platform, which we could see here is the connecting terminal to this copper ring, which is not yet buried in this photograph, at least when it was taken. And this, of course, connects to all 130 radials going in each direction. Now, it was proposed to me by Eric Dollard that it is wise to plant some type of vegetation upon this type of surface area or this type of ground situation because the roots of this vegetation will likewise go into the earth at some distance but will also fill up the various gaps which the radials could not. And because vegetation is of natural and organic composition, it's going to act as a decent ins um, conductor since it also contains a decent water content if it's watered regularly. But of course, this is difficult when you live practically in a desert in the suburbs of Pasadena, California. And now I will go into the part of the actual concerning the coil configurations and general apparatuses involving telluric communication in general, which of, um, of course could be applied to various other experimental Hertzian modes, as in just Hertzian radiation, often antenna system, but nevertheless, I will just confine myself to the Tesla telluric systems. Now, before we actually get into the construction, I want to point out the overall field or the way the various fields which present themselves in a dynamic manner upon just a single coil or just a simple wire wrapped around a form exhi exhibit themselves. So in this case, we will confine ourselves to the electrostatic field or the dielectric field, which contains two parts to it, which I won't get into right now. But nevertheless, it has a radial pattern. And because of the property for dielectric field to interact with various other media and matter in its surrounding area, we could say, based off of Steinmetz's uh, power equations in any general sense, that over a cubic volume, such as a cubic inch, these lines of force will be absorbed by that cubic inch of whatever material it is. So if it is air, we'll say just as what permeates everything, that this air will exhibit less of a loss to these dielectric lines of force. Now, of course, this matter and this surrounding media does play a role on the circuitual magnetic field lines or just overall magnetic fields which present themselves along these coils, but we won't really get into that for now. We could see that the dielectric constant does vary depending on the material as acrylic, as in this case, which is shown clear, does contain and is used in various applications which not only involve a clear translucent material, which typically has a dielectric constant of 2.7, around 3, but in cases where it becomes less translucent or less or more absorbent to the lines of force and overall propagation, then we see a dielectric constant which approaches 4, but in some cases it is even goes up to 6, which is quite incredible. And its loss tangent, respectfully, at the same frequency of 1 megacycle, is better than that of PVC, but it is still quite high, which you could see before you. And of course, one of the most, or probably one of the most common used materials, well, which Tesla also employed in his system, but most people would use, as I did use in the early days of constructing these Tesla magnifying transmitters, wood is fairly popular. It is a natural organic compound, quite readily available, quite economical in size and availability but its dielectric constant is still quite high. 
the actual crystal detector, which is only using an aerial sus uh, suspended about 10 feet in the air, receiving the exact same station and exact same audio at the exact same time, supposedly, which is lagging the telluric wave. Now, we could say that because it is receiving the audio wave, there's no exactly no possibility for any radio station or RF phase shifting to occur as otherwise would occur if we were to directly measure it off the detector or the tuning circuit of the crystal detectors going to the setups. Now from what I deduced over this, oh and actually I, forget, I forgot to show this one, so we could see that the telluric wave is leading the overground wave by a certain degree, which I will show later, but if we take the same setup, the uh, Hertzian setup, just using the aerial, the crystal detector, which is shown in yellow, and also shown here in yellow, and we compare it to that of, a, of the similar radio station audio signal, except this is being received magnetically with a different receiver uh, within the same proximity, except instead of using a single wire aerial, it is using a magnetic loop antenna. So in this case, it is magnetically picking up the radio station. But even then, because they're both hertzian or both overground modes, we could see that both waves are in phase. We are operating in this mode at 1.74 megacycles. Now, I do want to point out that with the assistance of Dr. Adrian Marsh, that we were able to get this coil into a balanced configuration as the frequency shows a lower mode of operation. Now, typically, if we were to measure this and operate this in the typical system where we just have a signal generator lead to that of the secondary coil, we would measure a frequency roughly approximating 2.3, 2.4 megacycles. But because there are different modes which are designed for different purposes, and in this case we want to achieve a longitudinal mode, this longitudinal mo mode, or just entire mode in tandem, seems to allocate itself to a lower frequency. And this is just the overall working of the entire setup. So now I will stop talking, yeah, and actually operate the unit. Okay, I will slowly increase, oh, second one, okay. I will slowly increase the power. We are at 10 watts. We are increasing power. We can see that the filament is starting to illuminate with one wire alone. And I will slowly start to increase the power even further. We are now at 50 watts.